Andrea Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you'd give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you want to learn more about how to turn your knowledge into a money-making newsletter while you're still an undergrad, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest did just that his senior year. And as of early 2023, when we're doing the interview, that newsletter has passed a thousand paid subscribers. But before I introduce you to Edwin Dorsey, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T for C's newsletter that features unique firsthand career insights and advice into dozens of different industries from the professionals like Edwin who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my newsletter loving Nespresso drinkers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Edwin Dorsey, author of The Bear Cave, the tagline of which is exposing corporate misconduct. The Bear Cave is a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to for free or as a paid subscription where you'll get access to additional bells and whistles on Substack. And Substack, in case you're not familiar with it, is a self-publishing online site for newsletters and it's also for podcasts. Before Edwin launched the Bear Cave for free in early 2020, he was a senior at Stanford University majoring in economics. By October of 2020, Edwin started a paid subscription offering and was making enough, I think, right away to support himself, which is So cool. We're going to be getting into all of that. And he has since gone from a little known newsletter with a couple hundred paid subscribers, which is no small feat in the fall of 2020, to a powerhouse newsletter with over a thousand paid subscriptions. And that's been in just over what, two years since you went from paid to wow. He has since gone on to create another written product on Substack called. Sunday's Idea Brunch, where Edwin interviews people he considers to be great investors who are off the beaten path, and then he has them share their best ideas with his subscribers. We're going to be talking all about how Edwin cracked the code on newsletter writing, the power of networking while you're still in college, and how Edwin turned his passion for investing when he was a kid into a niche expertise that is making him a whole lot of money right now while building his professional brand all on his own. Edwin, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I'm caffeinated. I'm ready to rumble. And I'm very excited to be here, Andrea. We are going to have an awesome time. Yay. I know we are. So before we dig into how you started writing your newsletter, The Bear Cave, back when you started it in February of 2020, while you were still an undergrad at Stanford. I'd love for us to kick off our caffeinated chat, Edwin, with what the bear cave, those words, bear cave, stand for, and what the newsletter consists of today. 
Absolutely, Andrea. So the Bear Cave is a newsletter focused on exposing corporate misconduct and companies kind of up to no good, misleading investors or harming customers. In Wall Street terminology, there's two words thrown around a lot, bulls and bears. Bulls generally being people who are betting on stocks to go up, who are very optimistic, and bears who might be betting on a stock to go down, who might be a little more pessimistic. So, you know, bears, short sellers are kind of interchangeable terms. And since my newsletter is kind of focused on the wrongs companies are doing or trying to identify bad companies that might be going down in the future, it kind of made sense to name my publication the bear cave. So it's it's kind of hinting at that bear terminology there. Yeah, I love that. And the newsletter, I like to joke, like my job is to send six emails a month. There's two components to the newsletter. There's the free version going out every Sunday where I kind of just recap that week's events. I summarize new activist reports that other people are writing on companies. And hey, these are the criticisms being leveled by others against other companies. I highlight notable resignations. So if a CFO resigns after just six months at a company, that's not a good sign, especially if there's other resignations. So I'll try to highlight like 10 of the most important resignations from that week. I'll link to three other articles I find interesting. And I'll highlight some interesting tweets because I'm addicted to Twitter. So that's kind of the free version that goes out every Sunday. And then the paid version is twice a month on the first and third Thursday. I'll write my own article, my own mini deep dive investigation into a company that's misleading investors or harming customers. So I might file a FOIA request with a state regulator for consumer complaints on a company and say, hey, look, a lot of consumers are going to regulators and saying that this company has a product that's impossible to cancel or they're being overbilled or they're not happy with the company's services. This is going to affect the company in the long run. Therefore, you, you know, you might want to be a little skeptical of this management team and not invest in them. So that's kind of the crux of my newsletter, try, trying to sift through all the noise to find bad actors in the market and, you know, identify them and highlight them for the world. So it's very similar to how like an investigative journalist might act, except I'm doing it completely independently through Substack, earning money directly from readers. You took the words out of my mouth, Edwin, because as I was reading Substack, what went through my mind is Edwin is a journalist. He's an investigative journalist. And then I listened to one of the podcast interviews you gave and you described yourself as you could be a yeah. journalist in other, in another life, maybe, maybe in this life, maybe in another <laughs> chapter. Before we get into all of that, let's go back to your focus because you talk about corporate misconduct. That actually has a very specific term that's used to describe the kinds of companies that you're focusing on, or maybe it's the kind of financial area that you focus on, and that is short selling. I listened to you describe it on that other podcast whose audience are probably investors or involved in finance in some way, shape or form. As someone who is not <laughs> involved in finance, other than dealing with somebody who manages my money, I got to admit, Edwin, I was still a little confused. So for those of us who are either semi-literate <laughs> or illiterate. <laughs> Can you break it down for us? What is short selling and how did you decide to focus on that niche? Absolutely. So short selling at the simplest level is just a bet against a company. Now, mechanically, the way it works is you go find a company you think is going to fall in price. Let's say I want to bet against Apple. I approach an Apple shareholder and say, hey, will you loan me your 10 shares? I'll give them back to you at a future date and I'll pay you know, a small amount for the inconvenience. So I borrow your Apple shares. I sell them today for $100. And if the stock falls to 80 tomorrow, I buy them back and I give it to you and I pocket the difference. So I sold your shares for 100 and I bought it back at 80. So I pocket that $20 difference, less a small fee for the inconvenience. And the shareholder is just viewing this as a little bit of extra income by loaning out their stock because they would have owned it either way. Now, the danger with short selling is stocks can also go up 
a lot. They can fall and you'll make money if you're short a stock, essentially owning negative shares. But if it goes up, you're going to be forced to buy it back at a higher price. So there's huge risk because you can lose an unlimited amount of money. It's important to know, I actually never short or take positions against the companies I write about. Some readers or subscribers to my newsletter might, but I'm not actively trading stocks as much as most people think. And in my newsletter, there's a lot of other people like law firms, regulators, just investors who just find it interesting, who read it. Now, to go to the second part of your question, what got me into this? How did you go into this like weird little niche of short selling? I've always been passionate about stocks from a really young age. Like second grade, I was all about the stock market. I started writing a little online anonymously through a website called Seeking Alpha in high school. And that was getting a little traction. And then freshman year of college, I got really lucky where I got introduced to two of the biggest short sellers out there. One guy was named Mark Cajotes. He previously ran a billion dollar short only fund and he lived in Northern California. So I went to meet with him and he kind of got me excited and got me on Twitter and showed me like, you know, how being a short seller could be a lot of fun because you're going, you're taking down companies, you, you're actually having an impact on the world if you expose corporate misconduct. The other person I got introduced to was Jim Carruthers, who ran a short only fund called Sophos. And I ended up interning for him on and off for all four years of college. So I like to joke, if two of my early mentors were micro cap investors, I would have probably gone there. If two of my early mentors were private equity titans, I might have been drawn to that. But because two of my earliest mentors were these kind of short selling people, that, that's where I got drawn to. And it's been a crazy ride and very exciting. So how were you introduced to them? Because I read one article about you from a couple of years ago, and it suggested that maybe you were the one who reached out to them and were, let me put this nicely, you were persistent in Uh getting in front of them. So how did that story unfold? So Andrea, you've done your homework. So for Mark, one thing I found that is always good at like creating luck and creating introductions is putting stuff online, whether it's a podcast, a video, writing, something. So I've been tweeting a little and I've been writing a little online. And I think I tweeted, hey, I'm going to like California for school. Is there anyone I should meet? And somebody's like, you should meet Mark Cajotas. Here's his phone number. So when I get there freshman year, I call him up and I'm like, hey, I'm a freshman. I'm interested in shorts. I've like read about you. Like, will you meet with me? He just is like, hangs up. And I'm like, (laughs) he literally hung up the phone. He, He didn't say no. What? He literally hung up the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he just thought I was some nonsense person. I, I, I don't think he, it wasn't a scheduled call or anything. I just yeah. had his phone number and, you know, I just thought I'd introduce myself. And But he didn't say no. Like I, so I just called him back and I'm like, hey, I'm, a, I'm actually, you might have thought I was some joke or prankster. I'm like, hey, I'm actually a freshman. I'd love to meet with you. And now he's like opening up a little. And I, and I was like, he lived uh, an hour north of where I went to school. And I'm like, hey, I'll get an Uber tomorrow to meet with you if you want. And it was a very... Very expensive Uber, but he offered to meet with me. And then we hit it off because I came there prepared. I showed him some other stuff I'd written in the past. I came with a lot of questions and he kind of loved it. And how old of a guy was he at the time? He he was like 50, 55, kind of retired hedge fund dude who you know, had a high flying hedge fund, then it closed under, you know, not great circumstance, but just just a very smart, very well off individual who'd been established. And, you know, so sometimes it helps to be a little crazy. And then the I, I got to guy- stop you there just for a second, Edwin, because this man, I have to imagine, was the age of your parents. Yeah. All right. And you could have been the age of one of his kids. Mm-hmm. And he's a busy guy. And you said, I'd like to come out tomorrow. And he said, okay. Or how did that go down? I think I said, hey, can I, I saw he was tweeting about a stock that I'd also done research on. I'm like, hey, can I give you a presentation on this stock? So then it's, there's a little bit of, you know, now he knows I've done the research. He's going to be a little interested in hearing what I have to say. And if you, if sometimes when somebody's very kind of important or busy, it helps just to, I found people generally don't like stuff on their calendar three months out. It's a lot easier to say yes to something tomorrow at this time than two weeks out. So if you just say like, yeah, I'll go mute. 
you. I think I skipped a class to go and meet with him. And, you know, I, I offered to do it at his house. So it's easier for him. And it was, this has been like seven years ago. So it was a while ago. But, you know, being high energy, nice, coming with a lot of questions, coming with something to show someone, it goes a long way versus asking them to meet at a coffee shop at a certain time and not being prepared. You know, there's certain things you can do to throw the luck in your favor a little bit. What did he say about your presentation on the stock? Uh, he, he was impressed. Then we started calling other people he knew. And I'd, I'd pitch to them over the phone. This was a company called Malincrot. They had a drug called Actar where they raised the price like 30,000% and were like paying people to prescribe it. And the company later went bankrupt. And so, so we were kind of like doing work on this and all their unethical shenanigans. So he, he liked the presentation and he convinced me, he's like, you're going to meet a lot more people if you get on Twitter. So he then and there made me make a Twitter account. And then that's what kind of started this upward spiral of luck where I made a Twitter account. He tweeted to people, go follow this kid. And then that's how I got my first 200 followers or something. And then from there, Twitter became a, like a launching point where I'd start to meet tons of people through Twitter, Twitter DMs, setting up meetings that way. So that was like a big, big turning point early freshman year for me for just getting noticed and getting lucky. Amazing. And now the second guy, was it Carruthers? Is that yeah, right? Jim Carruthers. Um, how did you connect with him? He's a lot more normal down to earth. So Mark is a little crazy and he'd tell you that Jim is just a, a normal down to earth guy. And I was writing anonymously on this website called Seeking Alpha about this company and criticizing them. And I said in my bio, I lived in California, Palo Alto, but he, he didn't know like I was a student. He just knew I was somebody in Palo Alto and he lived there. So he reached out to me being like, hey, I like your anonymous blog. Would you want to grab coffee? And he definitely assumed like I was going to be a professor or like an adult or an hedge. And I show up as this like 18 year old kid and he's like, just confused. And, you know, he's like, you should intern for me. So, you know, I think it was just that, that he didn't know he was even meeting with somebody so young right away or actually. Actually, I got a little wrong here. What would happen is we set up a meeting or he said his assistant would schedule a meeting and it just like never materialized. And I'd going back and forth. And then I just called him and I was like, hey, do you want to actually meet? And th then that's how it ended up happening. But yeah, two, two crazy lucky intros and it kind of changed my life. Oh, it sure did. So talk a little bit, Edwin, about how you find your stories, not as a journalist, but as a newsletter writer, and you actually have another way of describing yourself, you call yourself an activist. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's, there's no easy label for what I do because it's so novel and Substack and running your own newsletters is kind of like a, a new field in a way. I'm addicted to Twitter and Twitter is how I meet people. It's how I get intros and it's how I get ideas on stuff to write about. So, you know, I'm scrolling Twitter two, three, four hours a day when I'm walking, when I'm living life. I'm an addict. I got like 10 different folders for bookmarks, but that's how I find a lot of things. So I've criticized a public company called Roblox. And I found that because somebody tweeted out a YouTube video that was critical of them. I also watch a lot of YouTube and consumer complaints and stuff like that. And after a while, the YouTube algorithms like this guy likes watching videos on people complaining about companies. Let's serve them a lot of that type of content. So Twitter, YouTube, I get a lot of inbound tips from readers. Now that the newsletter is big, like 35,000 people on the free tier, it's like people know if, if they get screwed over by a company, they want to tell me. And now that it has a little bit of a following, I get tips and inbound calls. So once it gets big, writing a newsletter, it's actually easy to find ideas because everybody's just coming to you and you know where to look. It was a lot tougher when I started because because then nobody was interested in giving me tips. They didn't know who I was. So that was a lot more reading legal filings, reading SEC filings, reading informal SEC correspondence to like figure out like little hints of like companies up to no good. So it was tougher in the beginning. But now that it's big, tons of reader tips, Twitter, YouTube, everywhere I look, I can find stuff. How did you know how to read an SEC filing? Did you take a course on it? So I didn't really take any, I, I'm unique, uh, Andrea, because everything I did in college is kind of irrelevant to what I do today. What, what helped me a ton 
was interning at a hedge fund where they knew how to research companies and read uh, SEC filings and do this type of work. So that was kind of key that just like lived experience working at a fund taught me how to do a lot of this work that otherwise I wouldn't know how to do. I was also like a kind of addicted to watching YouTube interviews with really successful people when I was in college. So like every Bill Ackman interview, every Warren Buffett interview, I watched a lot of those. I think you can learn a lot on like YouTube. The biggest thing was work ex- intern experience followed by YouTube. And I, I, I don't know if you know, college really helped me at all. I did take maybe one or two courses, but that that's not how I got really good at this stuff. Do you think you could be doing what you're doing right now if you hadn't gotten a degree? So I, I think it's a little bit of like a catch-22 where it's not the stuff I learned in college, but without the degree, people probably wouldn't have met with... If you say, hey, I'm a 19-year-old who dropped out of college, didn't go to college, want to meet with me, I think most people would be skeptical. But if you're emailing from your college email and you show you're established and you know that kind of helps. So for me, it wasn't necessarily the contents I learned in college. It was the connections, the ability to get great internships, to meet with people, to network, to you know, get a little bit of credibility right off the bat and to have four years where, you know, you can like you get free food and housing and, and, and just, well, it's just, not exactly free, <laughs> not, not, not exactly free. I was very lucky where my parents paid for me. So, you know, but just having that stability for four years to build yourself up that, that, that helps a ton for me, at least. One of the stories that you wrote, which I'm not sure if it was a part of the bear cave, or if this was pre bear cave, was an investigation that you did of care.com. What was care.com? And what was the story? So Andrea, this is sophomore year of college. I think I'm 19. This is two, two and a half years before I start the bear cave. And care.com was a publicly traded babysitting platform where parents could go to find babysitters and babysitters could go to find work. And at this point, I'm interested in companies that my friends know I'm researching corporate misconduct. And I had a friend who was a babysitter on the platform and she's like, it's sketchy. You should look into them. And I know you like looking at companies. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check them out. And I looked up lawsuits against them. And right away, there was like a bunch of lawsuits of parents alleging like the platform wasn't doing the background checks they claimed to be doing. And then I saw like a bunch of local news reporting saying, hey, like this felon was able to sign up on the platform and pass their background check, even though like a parent would pay for background check on care.com person. I'm like, I wonder if they're like even doing their background checks they claim to be doing. They're charging parents for background checks. This is a big part of the site. You got to, if you're running a babysitting platform, you got to verify people are who they say they are. So I decided, hey, I'm going to test out the background check process for care.com by trying to sign up as Harvey Weinstein. So I use a photo of Harvey Weinstein. I use his name. I use the email address, Harvey, the babysitter, gmail.com, make up a social security number address. I just basically was like, I, there's no way they approve Harvey Weinstein to be a babysitter. Where was this in the Me Too movement? This is right when he's at the peak of like being criticized, right? Because okay. I'm a student. I'm like, who can I use? So I use I use three people. I use Daffy Duck, Donald Trump, and Harvey Weinstein. But Harvey Weinstein was the funny one. And three, so I submit the application. And three days later, they say we're going to get back to you in 72 hours, whether or not you're approved after we run the background check. And I'm like, there's no way they approve me. Three days later, it's like, hello, Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. And I'm like, literally, as a babysitter, as Harvey Weinstein on care.com. And there's like verifying my profile. They said I'm CPR certified. I'm like, they're not doing any of this, like, you know, vetting they claim to be doing. So, of course, I'm screenshotting all of it. And what do I do? I write a little article. I tweet it out. It goes. And where did you put it? Where did you publish the article? So the first I wrote two in total. The first one was on Scribd, like this file sharing platform. And then the second one was on Medium, this blog platform. And, you know, and it, it, it like the stock fell, a board member resigned the next day. It became a thing. I'm getting Twitter followers. Like, you know, now hedge funds are starting to know. It's like, who's this guy doing this interesting work, this sophomore? And uh, the company got pissed. 
So obviously, so they called my college to try to get me in trouble saying I was like breaking their Wi-Fi policy and stuff. And it, it got, you know, so then, you know, a Stanford dean meets with me one on one and is like, you need to take your article down because you're violating the Wi-Fi policy. And I'm like, no. And it becomes this big thing. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm going to dig in now. I'm pissed. So then I filed FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests with every state attorney general in the U.S. for consumer complaints on this company. I'm like, I wonder what other consumers are complaining about you. And I start getting hundreds and hundreds of pages of them for their background checks for overbilling. They make it impossible to cancel. I'm like, this is crazy. So I write the second article on last day of classes in college just so they can't get me in trouble again. Because Your the- sophomore year. Sophomore year, sophomore year, last day of classes, literally the day I'm flying home, I decide to publish this article. So I know my college can't get me like upset at me. And and then that gets viral. And then I pulled emails, something like 100, 150 journalists being like, you need to look into this. This is absolutely crazy. And long story short, Greg Zuckerman at the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, was the one guy who could meet with me. I go to meet with him again. I think he's expecting someone older. And I'm just this kid with like, we're meeting in a coffee shop in this huge binder of documents yelling about things. I probably look crazy. And he's like, okay, I'm going to look into it. And then he and his the Wall Street Journal did an awesome investigation for like nine months. And front page story, kind of two years after I started looking at them, or a year and a half after I started looking at them, Care.com babysitters who had criminal histories killed eight kids. It became this huge issue. The CEO, CFO, general counsel resigned. I got a small shout out in the Wall Street Journal. And that's kind of what legitimized me. So this is now my like junior year in college. I'm getting a lot of Twitter followers. People are like, this guy who just out of nowhere was screaming about care.com kind of caused this huge commotion. Maybe he has some credibility. Maybe we should listen to him. And that kind of was ultimately what like gave me the momentum and like credibility to start the newsletter a year later. So it's kind of like Steve Jobs says, you can never connect the dots going forward. But looking back, it's like, okay, this thing actually led to a huge, huge part of my life. But I had no idea that signing up as Harvey Weinstein to be a babysitter on this platform would have actually led to like my entire like career up to this day. How's wow. that at the story? Oh my God. I, I want to ask you this question because I'm, I'm curious. Does someone like you who clearly has massive amounts of courage, really courage and cojones. <laughs> Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? Uh, so I know a lot of people struggle with it. I Okay. So when it comes to professional stuff, I really excel. And I, I, I if anything, I, I might have a, a arrogant syndrome where I'm like, I'm really good. And I think I'm good. But I think where it's honestly, the, the stuff I struggle with would be more, especially younger would have been like the personal relationships. If you, if you put me in a room full of wealthy people or like adults and like want me to present on the fly, I can do that. No problem. If you put me in a room full of kids my age and just say, go make friends, then I feel imposter syndrome. And I think for most people, most of your listeners it would probably be the reverse where you're fine with people your age and have tougher enough, you know, with older people. So everybody has their maybe own form of imposter syndrome. And mine has kind of counterintuitively been just more of the social dynamics, especially when I was younger, that, that, that would have been the tougher part for me. Yeah. I can see that. Were you an only child or are you an only child? No, I have three younger brothers. Oh, okay. So you're the oldest of four. Oldest of four. Me too. (laughs) Nice. Okay. Well, I see that more among only children because they're used to dealing with adults and there are no kids around them, but whatever, it's all good. Do you have any advice, Edwin, for college students, especially those graduating in 2023, who may be overwhelmed by a sense of imposter syndrome when they're reading job descriptions or hearing about their friends landing what sound like amazing jobs? 
So I guess the first thing to remember is life is a really long game. We got hopefully 80, 100 years. So everybody has their ebbs and flows. And it is perfectly normal to like feel like you might be behind a little at one point that you're great at the other. So, you know, life's a long game. So never be too discouraged, especially when you're young. And don't ever like worry too much about others. The thing that's, I guess, unique about me is I never took the more standardized path of let me apply for jobs and like go that way. So I may be less like useful in giving advice there to somebody. But what I think most people don't notice as college students is there's very much an off the beaten pathway to do things. There's the, hey, this is an application, go apply here. And then there's always like a second and third way to get it done, which is cold email a bunch of cold email the CEO, go show up to meet him and see if you can get a job that way. And that would be like my way of trying to do it. So even though there's formalized processes for things, and that's fine, that's what most people do, the off the beaten pathway of trying to like form a connection with somebody at a company or better yet, get them to notice you is I think, you know, my default way of trying to do things. And if I could give one piece of advice to a college student who wants to elevate their career, Andrea, the one thing kind of I wish maybe I did as a college student is either write content online, produce stuff online. That gets you noticed. That gets you networked. That makes you smarter. That makes you good. Or like produce a podcast. Like if you're interested in a field as a college student, think of it. If you start a podcast, That means if you as a college student go call up like successful people, say, can I talk to you for 20 minutes? Most of them will not be interested. But if you say, do you want to come on my podcast and be interviewed? A lot of people will say yes to that, even like especially frequent podcast guests. So if you're a college student and you start a podcast, you'll be able to get access to all these successful people and ask them all the questions you wanted to ask. They'll remember you. In fact, they might be thanking you because you just gave them something. People love being interviewed. People love attention and feeling important. And as a college student, so you're networking with everybody great. You're learning a ton. You get this final product, which frankly looks amazing. And then everybody you interview, if you come prepared, you do your research, you do well, they're going to become your biggest advocate. And either they'll want to hire you or their friend who's looking to hire will want to hire you. So I focus on things like that, you know, rather than how can I like fill out this form the right way. So that, that, that would be my advice is sometimes like, It's like if you're looking for a friend, you're not going to find one. But if you're looking to be a friend, you're going to find a lot. If you're looking for a job, it's tough. But if you're looking to be useful and learn and contribute, everybody's going to want to hire you, if that makes sense. So that's my like... makes sense. And it's beautiful. It's out of the box and off the beaten path. And speaking of being off the beaten path, maybe in a bear's cave, (laughs) could you take us into a typical day? in the bear's cave. Is it just you working in your apartment where you're doing the interview from right now? Do you have any employees or contractors who work with you? What's What does it look like, Edwin? Andrea, it's just me in my apartment working. My building's kind of nice. So there's a second floor where you can like, you know, work if you want. I sometimes go there and a day in my life. It's pretty weird, frankly. It's going to, I have the weirdest days of anybody. So I I typically go to bed late, three or 4 a.m., which means I wake up late, like 11 a.m. noon. I typically do no work until the sun sets. If the sun's out, I like being out walking in the city or meeting with people and getting coffee and like being, I like walking like on the water. So that's or central park. So that's where I, what I'm doing if the sun's out and maybe I'm scrolling Twitter during that time, which is kind of work, but I like, I try to do 20,000 steps a day and then five o'clock. Now the sun sets, I work out, I get dinner, I shower, then it's about seven and my work hours are kind of 8 PM to 4 AM. So that, that's when I do all my work. I got no Why? employees. I just, so that's when I do my work. The only other times I'm doing work other than the hours of 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. are podcasts or phone calls or walk, walking meetings with people. I only do walking meetings. So that's kind of how I operate. And then to do the work, I'm typically reading SEC filings, watching a lot of YouTube consumer complaints, scrolling Twitter, filing for requests, reading lawsuits, just researching every possible thing I can on a company to kind of get this mosaic of information to suggest a pattern of misconduct, 
there's some software tools I pay for. Like I like Insider Score. I like Tegas. I like Bedrock AI to help, you know, sift through these thousands and thousands of pages of filings. But that's kind of my weird lifestyle. I, I fly solo right now. 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. is when I do my work. If the sun's out, I try to be walking 20,000 steps every day. And why is it that you are nocturnal? I don't. So I think it's just I get excited when I work and then my brain starts going at a million miles an hour and then I just lose track of time. I don't know. It used to be okay. It used to be so bad where right now I publish my articles Thursday, first and third Thursday at 1030 a.m. And as like most young people, I procrastinate a lot. So Wednesday night, I'm working and working. And it might become like, I'm actually like staying up throughout the entire night, finishing the article at 6 or 7 or 8 a.m. to go out at 10.30 a.m. So that's kind of what can cause the sleep to get uh, off sides where I I stay up really late to make this article great that needs to go out at 10.30 in the morning and sleep during the day. So it used to be like, I sleep during the day and I'm awake at night. That's not a healthy way to live. Like you should definitely be in bed like by three at least. So, um, God. <laughs> so, so yeah. I guess that's kind of my, my unique lifestyle. Yeah, it is. How long does it take you to produce your research, your deep dive articles for your premium members? So there's a like kind of saying that when you're passionate about what you do, the line between work and personal becomes very blurred. And that's definitely the case for me because on my walks, I'm thinking about this stuff all the time. And you know, one would say walking counts as work, but it's like, it kind of is. And it's not, it's not really clear. The writing itself might be one or two days. So, you know, on average, five, six hours a week. But, and then the research, it's just, it's just a very blurred line because I'd be doing this like regardless where I d- just watching like YouTube <laughs> count as work for hours upon hours and just taking notes on stuff. Like, I guess, I guess not. I would say in terms of like work that I either don't enjoy doing or just moderately enjoy, it's like a lot less than 40 hours a week. But, you know, it's like if I wasn't scrolling Twitter two hours a, a day, I don't think I would be as good at doing what I do. So does that count as work? It's just not clear is my point. You describe yourself as a social activist. And when I hear the word activist, that for me usually conjures up the image of somebody who's standing in the street holding a self-made sign or standing outside the White House of Parliament yelling something about the need to save our trees, the walruses, whatever the case may be. But that's obviously not what you're doing. What do you mean by social activist? So the big way I can have a real impact is if I find this story that no one else is paying attention to, highlight it in my newsletter, and then get some bigger media outlet to kind of write about it. And the quintessential example of that was the Care.com story, where if You know, maybe I'm being arrogant, but if it wasn't for me, this stuff wouldn't have come out or wouldn't have come out as early as it did. And, you know, not everything is like that. Most of my stuff kind of goes in the void or like a bunch of people read it, but it's forgotten in two weeks. So, you know, but by keep putting stuff out there, you kind of like every time there's a chance, it just strikes a moment, it strikes something big and, you know, it people pay attention. Uh, One example I had was there's this company Roblox, which again, like wasn't doing safety checks on sex offenders who were like coming on their platform to meet young kids. Not a good look for this video game company. And I kind of wrote about it and a bunch of people there who'd been arrested. And then like there was some backlash and a bunch of like outlets paid some attention. And later the companies like internal that had, had an internal leak and they even made an internal presentation addressing my article, like talking about the stuff they'd be changing because of me. And that's like, okay, even though I didn't get the viral moment from it, you know, extreme virality, it still had a little bit of an impact. Um, and over time, you know, I have a choice where I can shift the newsletter to kind of be a springboard to launch a hedge fund or do more stock focused stuff. Or the path I'm leaning towards is why not apply this more towards social activism where I can investigate a politician who's corrupt or a private company that's poisoning water or something like that. Now that you have this big kind of captive audience, a big email list who likes you, what can you use it for? 
And I kind of hope, you know, maybe I use it for more of the societal benefit stuff rather than just focusing on public companies. Is there a reason why you want to go this route rather than go work? I'm guessing the Wall Street Journal, any of the top brick and mortar media platforms out there would pay you a premium, but not what you're earning right now. And I want to say back of the envelope, please correct me if I'm wrong, Edwin. If you have, let's just say a thousand subscribers and you're charging $44 a month for this paid subscription, we're talking roughly half a million dollars. And I know that Substack, you're nodding, Substack gets 10%, but it's a really good salary. You'd probably, I don't even think star reporters, unless you were on a television network would be earning that kind of salary. So exactly. I'm, and I'm 24 years old earning ballpark half a mil. And it's like, that's crazy. That's kind of awesome. Why would you <laughs> that up for anything? And then more importantly, I have complete and total freedom. I can literally just do whatever I want every day. And that, that is such a privileged, lucky spot to be in. If even if you're a star reporter, you know, so much of bureaucracies, you got meetings, you got emails, you got training, you got all this. I got you can be so much more productive when you don't have a commute, you've not literally nothing you have to do that you don't want to do, you know, and there's maybe very small amounts of stuff that come with running a newsletter, like less than an hour a week of like customer support and stuff. But I can, and I can travel anywhere. I can go anywhere. And, you know, I didn't like love my college experience. So I'm trying to have a lot of fun in my twenties to make up for it. So yeah, if I'm looking out, I'm like, why not just keep growing this newsletter? It's for, I think it's useful for the world. It's an honest way to make a living. It's a ton of fun and just go like, have like an awesome time in your twenties. I've been able to focus a lot and getting in shape. I've lost like 40 pounds over the last 12 months, it's like, you can't do that. You can't have these like awesome things if you're working like a really tough job. Even if you were earning a million dollars a year at a hedge fund, it's like, you're, you're going to be... There, there was a saying I liked where a smart guy looked, was thinking of going to work for Goldman Sachs. He was really smart. And he's asked like, why did you decide not to work there? And he said, I looked at all the partners at the firm and they're all fat, bald, or divorced. Most of them, all three. And I decided like, why is this some grand thing? Why are we like elevating that? And I don't know, that always stuck with me that even if you're earning a ton of money, the status position, it's like, it's kind of nice if you can spend a lot of time taking care of yourself and be the best version of yourself and just be like a happy, productive, nice, empathetic person in the world. And being self-employed, writing your own newsletter, I don't know, enables me to have the potential to do that. And that's, that's something I never want to give up. Beautiful. And it's perhaps coincidental that you mentioned Goldman Sachs, which I think today the news is that employees are now for the first time, the largest number of Goldman Sachs employees ever are in the process of being laid off. So Uh not necessarily a sure bet. (laughs) This might be a good moment, Edwin, to quickly flash back to when you were an undergrad at Stanford, which wasn't that long ago. You majored in economics, as I've already mentioned. Now, before the spring of 2020, when you started Bear Cave, Did you know what you were going to do with your economics degree when you graduated? No. In fact, I was in a little bit of a bind because we mentioned how I was working at this hedge fund, Sophos, on and off for like all four years of college. Naturally, I probably would have ended up working there, but my boss was planning on retiring and the fund was kind of planning to shut down. So I was kind of in a pickle, this place where I had all my internships. I I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go work for them. And, you know, so now I'm like, shoot, like, where am I going to go work? Um, This is my senior year. And I'm I'm having a lot of fights with the administration per usual. And I... And it was the coronavirus pandemic. This is before the coronavirus pandemic. So this is, this is maybe September, 2019, November, 2019, senior year. And I'm like trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm talking to a lot of hedge funds, cold emailing them, trying to like make something happen. And I just, I just know it's not going to be a good fit because everybody seems so miserable and sad and focused on being on like making models all day. And I just really, I knew I could get that if I wanted, but I knew I really didn't want to. So I'm like still just trying to find the perfect fit and I couldn't. 
And just kind of going back to like what I learned with the care.com stuff is just start writing online and people will come to you. So my original plan with the newsletter when I started it in February, 2020 was I'm going to write online. I'm going to show people I'm like, good at this digging, maybe a little smart, and they're going to come and want to hire me. And so that was like kind of my game plan. And then the pandemic hit one month in. So I got sent, every, all the students went home and I just decided to graduate early. So I had like an extra three months to do stuff. And I'm living at home and I'm like, might as well try to make this newsletter successful. So I like cold email every college investment club to tell them to sign up. I literally like DM like that every, every single Twitter follower I had. I like spent three days. My eyes started to hurt just DMing every Twitter follower being like, sign up for this newsletter, please. And that's kind of what built the early momentum. And then, you know, I clawed my way to like 3000 free subscribers by October and people were starting to get interested in hiring me. To 3,000? Free, yeah. Oh, 3, free. Yes, 3,000 3, free. free. No one's paying. People are starting to get interested in hiring me. And I decided to turn on this paywall. And I have no idea how it's going to go. And it was, I think the first day it was like, like 10 people signed up. So we're looking at like $5,000 in annual revenue. And I'm like... I was, I was not crying, but I like call my parents. I'm like, I screwed up so big. I am like going to be earning nothing unemployed. I have got nothing. And then luckily within like two months, it had taken off and tons of people were paying for it. And I'm like, okay, it works. But yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what happened. So it's extremely roundabout where I just keep kind of keep taking these big risks and they kind of work. But the big thing that I, the term I kind of want to use on this podcast that's relevant for college students is like, luck surface area and try to find ways to increase your luck surface area. And that's something that I don't know why I just excel at doing. And you can do the, the way you, the way you don't increase your luck surface area is sitting in your room doing nothing. The way to increase your luck surface area is be the best version of yourself, be out in the world, try to meet people, introduce yourself, cold email, cold call, you know, just do interesting stuff, start a podcast, start writing online, literally anything. And that's all stuff to increase your luck surface area. Ask like professors at the grad. What, one thing I did is I asked, I was bored with the undergrad classes and just not interested in, you know, no homework even. So I just started asking the graduate school teachers, can I sit in on your class? And a lot never responded. And I just show up to their door being like, can we sit in your class? And I think I was just annoying them. So they'd say yes. And then what I noticed is graduate schools have a lot cooler speakers than the undergrad. So I didn't do any homework. I didn't get any credit. I just sat in the classes and introduced myself to the speakers. And like, you know, it just worked. So and what did you get out of the introduction about meeting these rock stars in the financial world? You learn a lot. And I always like, I, I don't like approaching somebody wanting something direct from them. So it like, if you are trying to get a job or internship, that's okay. That's how most people do it. But it's, to me, it's more wholesome if it's just, Hey, I genuinely admire you. And I just want to ask you questions. And then from there, you know, magic can start to happen. We're like one guy I met was Jim Chanos, who ran a big fund. And I just started asking him questions and it was clear I'd done my homework and you know, he offered me an internship. I didn't end up doing it, but it's like, that's kind of how I prefer. It's like a little like ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, give money twice. Is that the pitfall line? It's like ask for internships, get advice, ask for advice, get internships, if that makes sense. That's my motto. I'm a rapper now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what have you learned, Edwin, about the most important ingredients and structure, or maybe even the format? to building a successful newsletter? Uh, the key is, two keys are distribution and good content. Nothing's going to replace good content. If you have bad content, it's like, even if you get someone to become a paid subscriber, you're not going to retain them and they're going to leave after two months. No one's going to forward bad content. It doesn't matter like how you word it, sell it, how you like build hype. If it's bad content's bad, no one's going to read it. So you need to have good content. People want to read and pay for that adds value to them and ideally helps them do their job better. So that's key number one. But just doing that in a void, how are people going to hear about you? How is it going to sign up? Especially when you're small and newsletters growing through word of mouth, I think that's a tough game. You know, maybe it works over the period of years and years and years, but with newsletters, you, you want to get traction right away. So the other thing you need to do is distribution. And the great ways to build distribution for newsletters 
the three great ways are Twitter, get people on Twitter, get Twitter followers, and then convert those to free newsletter subs, convert those to paid newsletter subs, go on a lot of podcasts. I think podcasts are a great way to build a little bit of trust and energy and likeness. And so that that's a great way to get subscribers. You can also befriend other news that are authors and then you recommend your publications to each other. So that, that's kind of like the common ways to do it. Doomberg is an example of one guy who just came onto the scene a year ago and already has like 200,000 Twitter followers. And, you know, it's just killing it much bigger than I am and much faster. And the thing, the thing that I think people should realize is it helps to give. So if you just, if, if you just are trying to angle for yourself, it kind of doesn't work. But if you just like I, every year I make a list of all the best other newsletter authors and Twitter accounts and everything else, not expecting anything. Just like, let me make this list of everybody else I love to give them a shout out. And then that goes viral. And then everybody, then people naturally want to reciprocate and be like, Hey, you generated a ton of hype for me. Let me give a little back. So that's kind of how it works. Give a little, maybe get a lot, maybe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I have two final T4C questions, Edwin. These are questions that I ask all of my guests. And the first one is, if you could share a time in your professional life, maybe including the time as an undergrad when you were interning at the hedge fund, when you failed, when you fell flat on your face, or if you didn't fail, faced a huge challenge. And the most important part of this story is how you persevered. And if there was a lesson that you learned in the process. You know, I, so I didn't mention one internship here. I had a bad internship one time, my junior summer. And part of it was my fault. My boss had asked me to read certain books before I showed up and I didn't read those books he told me to. So, you know, slap on the wrist for me. And we just did not get along. It was awful. Like almost immediately, it just, we're clashing over everything. And I'm like, I'm almost crying every night. Like I'm just, this guy is pissed at me. And like, I I kind of have lost faith in him and what a mess. And it's supposed to be like a three month internship. And it's like one weekend and we're like already like at each other's necks. It's like so, so, so bad. And I ended up like, You know, I went to somebody else at the firm. I was like, hey, can I just switch bosses? And they're like, no. And I ended up quitting this internship after like two weeks. You know, talk about embarrassing to go from, you know, thinking you're really talented and then you can't even last two weeks or you kind of quit after two weeks somewhere. So that that was kind of that that was pretty humbling. So part of it was don't get arrogant, don't cut corners. You got to do, like, even if you think you're talented, you got to do the work because part of it was my fault. The other thing was I, as soon as I quit, I felt a million pounds lighter because this boss was like, you know, I, I think just like behaving wrong. And, you know, so sometimes it's like, you know, if you're in a toxic situation, the best thing you can do is like get out as quick as possible. And I was really fortunate where I could have I, I was able to quit and like just find a little other work and like be fine. But, you know, so that, I guess that's my takeaway. Don't cut corners going in because your first impression matters. And I screwed up that first kind of day and then that set the precedent for the a terrible two weeks. And then if something's really toxic, and I don't mean a little bad or struggling, but truly, truly toxic for a long time, the best thing you can do is just walk away. And if I, maybe if I didn't walk away, I would have like not been in a great place to start all this. But because I walked away and just kind of recovered from that quickly, I was able to have the success I've had. So that's one. Thank you so much for sharing. I know I've certainly been in toxic work situations before. And in some cases, I just dug in and can't say I'm necessarily happy that I endured that much longer in those environments. Last question, Edwin, if you were to go back to Stanford and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I really wish I could do that because I, I don't I don't think I took, you know, had as got as much out of college as I could have. I probably would have gone to a different school because, you know, Stanford's just not the right place for someone who's interested in what I'm interested in. I probably would have spent a lot of more time researching things. You don't want to ever sleepwalk through life. And that's kind of how I approach Stanford with taking the classes I was supposed to take, doing stuff last minute. 
if, if I if I was much more deliberate in building a plan, understanding all the requirements, under, these bureaucracies are tough to navigate. And if you let a bureaucracy destroy you, it will. And like you need to kind of be prepared, be on top of things. You know, an ounce of prevention is a pound to cure. So I wish I spent a lot more time just just figuring out the stuff I needed to do to get all the degree requirements rather than hustling at the end. I wish I spent a lot more time making friends and having fun and maybe antagonizing the administration less and fighting with the president and provost. Like, that's not a good way to live in college. You haven't finished that, though. You're still investigating Stanford. Yeah, now. yeah we, 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 we have a complicated relationship. I, I don't think they're going to be asking me for money anytime. But, but you know, I kind of wish college is a really unique part of your life. So have fun, make more friends, do more extracurriculars and just I, I got into the swing of things, maybe the second half of my college experience where I was getting into fun classes and meeting professors and stuff like that. I wish for the first year and two, I spent like less time in my room doing nothing and more time like living life and preparing and spending one or two hours to focus on getting into a fun, awesome class with an awesome professor is so worth it because a bad class is like so much worse than a good class. So it's like, I, I don't know how to, like, you know, doing the prep work and energy to, to figure all this stuff out in advance. I wish I spent more time on. Well, listen, Edwin, huge respect to you and congratulations for all of your success and your self-awareness. At such a young age, Edwin is the founder of the Bears Den newsletter. His Twitter handle is at Stock Jabber, J-A-B-B-E-R. No doubt the Edwin Dorsey rocket is barely off the launch pad. So much more success to come. I have no doubt about it. Thank you so much, Edwin, for making time for coffee today with me and the t for c community. I really enjoyed our conversation and personally learned a lot. Andrea, thank you so much for having me on Time for Coffee. Uh, I, I had a blast, so thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of t for c And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.